This is, to a lot of people, what we are talking about this morning is not very important. But to people who do know, what we are talking about is extremely important. We've just had a session on security uh, and integration and terrorism within Europe. We had a conversation about migrants into Europe. We had the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium saying people come and we send them back and then they come back again and so on. Um, the important thing to understand is why are people coming to Europe? They're coming to Europe because they don't like the places where they were born. They want a better opportunities, better income, better livelihoods. Why are they not staying in the countries that they were born in? They're not staying in those countries because those countries are, under, are underdeveloped or poor and don't give them opportunities. So they march with their feet to the, to the European continent, to e, the EU, to get a better life. So international development is not about being nice to poor people. It's actually preventing also those poor people coming and living and putting pressure on us. It's a two-way thing. It's the beginning and the end of integration, reformation, terrorism, security. All that depends on whether there is a huge march of people from the poorer parts of the world to the richer parts of the world. From, sta from unstable parts of the world to the stable parts of the world. Just imagine the Syria conflict happening in Egypt. There will be 30 million refugees coming into Europe. Are we ready for that? So these are, we are interdependent, interlocked, interlinked. We cannot separate being nice to poor people and giving them money to have a little better, better life. It is nothing to do with that. It is actually our lives, our security, our state of well-being that is at risk if we don't encourage and help other people to become better off in their own countries and so stay there rather than w walking and marching with their feet. But unfortunately, since its inception, the European Union has given a hundred, sorry, a thousand billion, yep, one trillion euro over the, from 1970s to today to poor countries from our taxpayer, one trillion euro to alleviate poverty and to reduce um, social deprivation. And what has happened? Did it work? No, it didn't work. The poor remained poor and became poorer. Africa didn't uh, prosper until very recently. It's only in the last 15 years that substantial improvements have taken place. First, led by China, who pulled 500 million people out of poverty. Extraordinary achievement. And now in Africa, with the Millennium Development Goals, in the last 15 years, we're beginning to see a reverse. But as we have tried to do this, Something rather strange happened to us on the way to the forum, as we used to say. We ran out of money. We don't have the money that is required from our taxpayer to fund what is required to give a stable, secure livelihood to the millions of people in Africa and the Middle East and parts of Asia. And since we started running out of money, it's, I, I, has, I started thinking, how on earth are we going to meet this challenge that a billion, people, a billion people still live on less than one dollar a day, and that more than 800 million do not have enough food to eat? If you don't have enough food to eat, what are you going to do? You could sit there, starve? No, you're going to march, you're going to walk, you are going to climb fences, and you are going to come where the food is. And that's what they are doing now. So how do we look after 
those 800 million who do not have enough food to eat, and the billion who are still living on a dollar a day. And we don't have any money. So when we started the strategic development goals, the 17 new goals for the next 15 years at the UN last year, we had to scratch our heads and ask ourselves, yes, we have lofty ambitions, we have very little money. How do we do that? At a time when the European economy itself was slowing down. So how do we create a win-win? We create a mutual market where they get pro better off and they buy from us and we get better off. So we thought of a new way of doing it. We thought of the private sector, because wealth is actually created not by politicians or distinguished officials or bankers, well, bankers do. Wealth is actually created by the private sector. 95% of global wealth is created by the private sector. Governments don't create wealth. So we started thinking of how to use the private sector as an engine for international development. When I first started talking about this in the European Parliament, all my socialist friends went red in the face. Now they are my partners in this endeavour. And we passed this report in the European Parliament, much to my own astonishment actually, that the private sector will become a key engine of growth in international development as far as the European Union is concerned. And in that regard, I had the most extraordinary support from the Commission. But you know the most magical thing that that did? Every year we were spending about 20 billion euro of taxpayers' money, giving it as grants, as gifts to the developing countries. When we brought the private sector in, we also brought the disciplines of the private sector. Proper accounting procedures, proper tendering procedures, proper accounts to be kept because private sector money will require a return. They're not going to fritter it away. They're not going to chuck it out, out there for nothing. They want the same disciplines of every company that runs a business. So we created the public-private partnerships, the PPPs, which meant that public sector money, the taxpayers' money, is now going to be spent under private sector disciplines, with private sector money also coming in to what we uh, fondly call blending. We invented a new word, economic blending. And in that blending, we use public sector money and private sector money under pub private sector disciplines of accounting, reporting, standards, the whole gamut of due diligence and so on to use the public sector's money in international development and to create wealth and businesses, enterprise, jobs, small workshops, canning factories, everything in sub-Saharan Africa and also in the other parts of the world. But you know the other magical thing that happened when we brought the private sector in? As almost by magic, we had a huge quantity of money falling on our laps. We found that we could use the public sector contribution as seed capital to leverage public, uh, private sector money. So if we now put 4.8 billion euro of the taxpayers' money into the pot, the pub private sector, the money markets, will put 66 billion euro leveraged into the same pot. That means we have about 70 billion euro growing out as a combined pot to invest, invest, not give, invest in businesses and ventures in the developing countries. 
And suddenly the European Union has become a massive bank and a partner in job creation, partner in business management, partner in enterprise, a partner in sub-Saharan African, Asia-Pacific businesses. All conceived out of this gentleman's head and with a little bit of help from me. And it worked. The day of my reporters passed, Marion Thyssen got up in the parliament and said, I'm converting 4.8 billion into 66 billion in investment in sub-Saharan Africa. In those days, we didn't have 66 billion. We only had 20 billion for the whole year. And we think we can convert our entire 20 billion into 300 billion worth of investments every year and more. We can create gigantic industries, enterprises, companies, manufacturing, using pub this blending in the developing countries, creating hundreds of millions of jobs. And the European Investment Bank, who is sitting on my left, I want them to have a role to play too. The same way they developed the infrastructure of the European continent, I think they have a role to play in build, own, operate, boo bots, build, own, operate, lease, and build, own, operate, sell projects in the developing countries.